My name is Joe Gordon. I'm a developer at HP and OpenStack. Um, I have a show of hands. Who here knows anything about OpenStack? Okay. So this isn't about OpenStack, luckily. This is only partially related to OpenStack. Um, so OpenStack is a, um, a cloud platform. So cloud operating system, I think, is the marketing term we're using now. Um, APIs, provision resources, sort of straightforward. Amazon Web Services, GCE, that kind of thing. Um, in a nutshell, OpenStack is a really big project. It's Python, lots and lots of Python. Um, it is, what are the latest numbers here? It's 2.3 million lines of Python in one project. I think that's the biggest open source Python project in the world. Um, I don't know of anything bigger. Um, we're also a big number of developers. The last year we've had 2,000 developers, 64,000 commits, um, almost 500 developers in the past month, and these are pretty average numbers. Um, as you can see here, we actually had a drop in, in uh, contributors recently. That's been due to because they had a big release. I think a few people are burnt out, and there's vacation and New Year's going on. Um, but overall, we've been growing and growing. There's this massive Python project. Um, and Python is not really the language you use for big projects. We have a few problems with that. Um, we have some basic design principles we try, to, we try to follow. Never break trunk. So when you have 1,000, 2,000 developers, you don't want to actually break the code for all 2,000 other people. Um, you have a lot of people angry at you and IRC for hours and hours, and that's no fun. Nobody likes that. Um, we also have people who are trying to deploy this continuously. So Rackspace Cloud and HP Clouds are deploying this continuously. Um, there, I think Rackspace is about a month behind trunk right now, give or take. Um, so that means you put a patch in. They're running it in public in production a month later. So we have to make sure this never breaks. Um, transparency. We try to do everything in the open. We're big. We're big believers in open source and all that. Um, automate everything. At this scale, you can't do things by hand. We try to automate as much as possible, reduce the burden on people. Um, egalitarian, this is an open project. Um, and we want to try to be strict and reduce the burden on the reviewer. So we automate as much as possible here. Um, so you put a patch up, and what happens if you put a patch up? You run a lot of tests on you. Um, we have a style guide test that's PEP8 in Python. Uh, run unit tests. We support Python 2.7, 3.3, and 3.4 now. Um, and we support 2.6 for some older versions. Um, we have an integration environment called DevStack, so that's development and testing environment for us. And we run Tempest, which is our integration test suite on top of that. Um, we run that a few times in different configurations we support. Um, in, in our testing, we test MySQL and Postgres. We test a few networking configurations. Um, we have two net networking drivers right now. We test both of them. Um, so we have a lot of different configurations we're testing all the time. And furthermore, we have upgrade testing it called Grenade. Um, a lot of users don't like upgrades failing on them, so we test upgrades all the time to make sure we never break upgrades as well. Um, when you're doing continuous upgrades and continuous deployment, that becomes really important really quickly. So inside of this integration environment, we're running hundreds and hundreds of uh, secondary VMs. So all these uh, jobs are running inside of VMs, and then the VMs are spinning up VMs inside of them, QMU, small, empty VMs for testing. So you put a patch up, a nice, this is a real example. You fill, uh, fix a spelling bug, and it goes up and you get the code review comes back, and uh, our Jenkins system runs some tests on your reports back to you. And it fails. But that doesn't make any sense, because this isn't actual code failure. Nothing about this change could have caused any failures in, ever. This is just you know, a comment. Somebody made a mistake. It's a spelling error. No tests are actually covering this. So what happened here? So we see this a lot, and this is really frustrating for developers. And you, know, you make a change, it fails, not because of you. So what happens when you're actually running these tests? We have anywhere from 5 to 10 dev stacks running, depending on the project. So that's our integration environment. Um, tens of thousands of integration tests running inside of those integration environments. I think we're at, I think, 1,000 integration tests per Tempest job. Um, and we have a few of those running on some projects. Um, a lot of data. We have a huge stream of data coming through. Um, and we have a lot of patches coming through. And our high watermark is in uh, one week, we merged 561 patches in a week. Um, so that's hundreds of patches a day, thousands of reviewers, thousands of developers working on this. So this is a really big problem. We have a lot of these failures happening all the time. Uh, put a patch up, something fails, not, do, you know, not your fault. Um, and then furthermore, we have a lot of uh, patches going through. We have you know, every 40 days or so, we go through 10,000 new patches. So that's not including revisions of old patches. We have a lot more um, new patches coming in on that. Um, our test node cluster now, I think, is 800 machines. And I think we're using it most of the time. So that's 800 machines or so running all our tests for us. And that's running pretty continuously um, at a high, high capacity. So let's talk some basic probability here for large numbers. Um, we have the chance of event, the chance of a, the number of events per run. 
Um, so let's say boot an instance. You may run that a lot of times in a, do that a lot of times in a test. Um, the number of runs. So this is a real example we had. Um, GitHub is down 0.05% of the time. That's actually a great uptime. That's really quite good. Um, but you're on 20, 20 clones per run. That number is actually much higher now. I'm not sure the exact number we're at now, but it's quite higher than that. Um, you're on 1,000 runs or more per week. That means we're having GitHub failures 15, of the, or 15 times a week. So 15 people are pushing patches up and failing due to GitHub. Um, and as a result, we don't clone from GitHub. We have our own massive Git uh, server farm that does this all for us. So where do these failures come from? Some of them are just sort of internet breaks. You know, we have transient timeouts, all kinds of things. Um, but also OpenStack is a big, complex piece of code. It's thousands of developers, two million lines of code. I think it's 30 or 40 binaries running to, for the whole thing if you're running all the services. Um, this is actually a very outdated image. This is, I think, two years old at this point. And it's twice as big now, if not bigger. Um, it's this big, complex thing. There's a lot of services, a lot of developers working on it. And we have a lot of hidden complexity in this. Um, so how we did this before, how do you manage these failures? You push a patch up. Something fails. It's a race condition, let's say, in the code. Um, one service is talking to another service, but not handling the race, a race properly. Um, you get a, you know, a failure back. You look into it. You realize it's not your problem. You run recheck. Um, we have a recheck command to re-trigger the jobs, the test jobs, if you realize it's a mistake. Um, and that's OK. But then how do you actually manage these failures and fix them and see what's going on? So you ask them. You say, hey, have you seen this? Um, and you point to a URL with all the logs. Then we collect all our logs for records and, and, and analysis. And you look at it, and it turns out you know, you're not good at, humans are not good at, at looking at this stuff. Our brains are not big data solutions. Um, you can remember a little bit at a time. You can't remember 100 bugs at a time. Um, and then a few years ago, we turned on parallel testing. So before, we were running a single uh, test runner for everything. And then we turned on, I think we're running two or four tests at, um, in concurrent, concurrently at any given time now. And that broke everything even more. And so we had a lot of race conditions we started hit that, hitting then. And everything started failing. And now we had tons of failures, and we couldn't figure out what was going on. And you can't remember all the failures. And you know, having 1,000 developers remembering, remembering what stack traces what bug doesn't work. Um, people get really grumpy when they waste their time looking at these bugs, and you, can't even, you don't even know what bug it is until you have to go through all the data and figure out, go through you know, a gig of logs and sort it all out, and it was really unpleasant. Um, so we changed it. We have a tool called Elastic Recheck to try to address this problem. So the key thing we're trying to address here is the, have you seen this recently? So we use a, we use a basic ELK stack, the Elastic Research, Elastic Search, uh, log stash, and Kibana stack. So this is Kibana. So we have a nice Kibana interface, logstash.openstack.org, and you can actually go and type a query in. We collect all our logs on there, and you can type a query, put a log in there, and see when it happened. Um, put a stack trace in, a new stack trace you started seeing, you see when it started happening. And it's been really great for actually being able to visualize these failures and better grapple these logs. Um, have you seen this recently? We actually try to remove the, that, hey, have you seen this part, uh, where there's a single person or a small group of people who are trying to who know what the failures are, and everybody has to ask asks them, ask them for, hey, what happened? Um, so we actually report back to the user, hey, we think you saw this bug. Um, you should go ahead and validate that. Make sure that's the bug that you saw, and that way they can see, oh, this failed not because of me. This is another bug in the system that we know about, um, and they can run recheck. So now they don't have to go through, you know, several gigs of logs and spend hours sorting out what service failed. Is it a race condition? Um, is there a stack trace? If there's no stack trace, it could be something else. Um, you have some really subtle bugs in there sometimes. And this helps make it much easier to figure out what's going on. And so the recently part is really important for us as well because bugs appear and disappear. This is a, the current example we have. Um, this actually is a really bad example of a bug. This is a bug saying we're unable to log into a VM, which this can mean you know, 100, 200 different possible things could go wrong to cause this. Um, but you can see you know, you have, this is over 10 days and some trends in it. Um, the trend here isn't actually that important here because you can see, I believe that's the weekend where there's the spike drops. Um, but sometimes you'll see a bug happened occurred in the, the last 10 days. Something happened. Maybe it was a um, something underlying system. Uh, sometimes it's a new patch went in, and you can actually see this bug started five days ago. And they could go back in the logs and figure out, oh, it must have been these three patches. And you look at each patch and figure out what happened. So what happens now when you submit a patch? Um, same thing happens before, run a lot of tests. 
And then Elastic Recheck sits all behind that. Um, with the test complete, uh, the question sent back to Garrett for the user to see on Garrett's our review system. It reports back to that and says, hey, um, these are the results. And at the same time, there are all the logs in a static log server. And I think that's still under, uh, is that under Swift yet? Not yet. Not yet. Um, we sorted a big, we sorted all the logs in, uh, this is for you know, record keeping. Um, our logs are actually so big they now crash uh, Firefox sometimes. So we now have uh, server side filtering as an optional thing. Because you load up you know, a 40 meg file in Firefox, it doesn't always work, unfortunately. Um, so you can actually, you know, this is because even the logs are so big that we're crashing browsers now. Um, we don't actually collect all the logs in Logstash. We ignore all debug logs because we just have too much information. We can't store that much information in our Logstash cluster currently. Um, so anything that is info or higher, we store in this Logstash or for, uh, an Elastic Search cluster. Um, and then we have two Elastic Reach at the same time. One is listening on the uh, Garrett stream for events. So that's um, where Jenkins reports back, hey, these are the results of your uh, job. And at that point, we actually go through and look for a failure in that. And then we have a bunch of fingerprints and known patterns for failures. And we run our, our patterns on, that, uh, on the logs via Elasticsearch and see if we find any bugs that we know about in there. So a simple example, so we see a stack trace in a uh, Nova compute service, let's say. Um, and we know it's known to cause a certain bug. We do that by hand currently. Um, you can say, hey, we saw this, you know, this job failed. We saw this stack trace in your log, and this log, it's probably this bug that you saw. Um, at the same time, we actually want to have long-term st uh, statistics that we track on a higher level. How often has this bug happened? Um, sort of that big view, not the per patch view. And we have a, a script that runs every 30 minutes, I believe, that updates a website that lists all the bugs we have. And that is... So this is that page here. Um, you can actually see we have 87 or 80 or so uh, known bugs today. Um, so this list is up to, I believe. Um, we see a whole bunch of bugs here, different patterns, different frequencies. Um, things are actually working pretty well right now. We only have, this bug has 62 failures in the past 24 hours. That's actually pretty low considering how bad some of these bugs could get. Um, you see all kinds of different trends in here for different bugs. Um, a lot of bugs are really infrequent. Here's a good example. We had a issue with it came out, and you see this massive spike of bugs. Then we fixed it, and it mostly went away. Um, so here's an example you see on January 9th, a new version of Bodo came out, and then we fixed it shortly after the same day, and it's now mostly fixed. So when we started this out, we thought there were about you know, maybe six to ten major bugs at any given time. Um, we got so many bugs at one point, and things got so bad that we actually had to stop development and fix all the bugs. We had to tell everybody, stop pushing patches in. Nothing was passing. When you get enough bugs in the system, the odds of a single job you know, running that has 1,000, 2,000 uh, tests in it is almost zero. Um, and then we have a bunch of these jobs running. And so the combined effect was that it was really hard to land a patch. And people were grinding away saying, recheck, recheck, recheck. And nothing was merging for the backlog would get you know, 70 hours to get you know, a report back if your um, patch passed or not, and that kind of thing. But what really happened is it actually turns out we have a lot of bugs. We have a lot more than six to ten major bugs. Um, right now we have 80, 80, 90 bugs, and that's a pretty common number we have. Um, it turns out we're really bad at recognizing lots and lots of patterns. Humans can only detect a few patterns. Phone numbers are ten digits for a reason. We can't rem remember you know, a 50-digit number that easily, that kind of thing. Um, we found a whole bunch of different categories of bugs here. We found um, upstream service providers. They have all kinds of things. We have PyPy's bad certificates. Um, you know, app mirrors that fail. We use, uh, you know, every so often some app mirror doesn't work that well and it breaks us. Um, the providers from our, our HP and Rackspace infrastructure, um, I, infrastructure as a service clouds will break sometimes. Um, DNS issues, GitHub outages. Um, we have bad upstream uh, PIP releases. We had one a couple days ago, in fact. Um, all kinds of problems like that. Upstream things that we sort of can't out of our control. Um, as a result of some of this, we cache as much as we can and we try to stay away from the network. Um, you know, having a network call and a test turns out to be really unstable sometimes. Um, we have a few, our, our, our infrastructure breaks every so often. It doesn't happen a lot anymore, thankfully, um, but it happens every so often. The images we build things on may break occasionally. Um, our mirrors could break, that kind of thing. Um, and we're in the progress of making that better and better all the time. Um, and we have a lot of bugs in OpenStack itself. And that comes to all that, you know, inherent complexity of having thousands of developers writing in Python, a big asynchronous system, um, 
with no, you know, there's no compile time, you know, static analysis in Python. It's sort of a, it's a big complex system. There's no one designer of it. It's very organic. Um, and so we have a lot of all kinds of bugs in it. We have, there's a lot of asynchronous work. You know, Buddha instance, that's a lot, this is a slow thing. You don't get a result right away. There's a lot of asynchronous communication happening for that across a lot of services. Um, you have database deadlocks. We have a lot of those every so often. We have race, race conditions with multiple workers. We had a bug in Nova Scheduler. Two schedulers, uh, they could race each other and that kind of thing. We had bugs in the tests. When we went to concurrent uh, testing, we had all kinds of unsafe global uh, states. And we also had things like we had a timestamp assumptions in the test. So you say, you know, you assume the timestamp's not changing your test. You're doing some, you know, looking for something that's a timestamp in it. And it, every so often you hit a threshold, the timestamp changes and it would fail. Um, then we get the really fun bugs, which are independent or in our dependencies. We've had all kinds of libvirt bugs, you know, maybe half dozen, I think, at this point. We had a great bug, which was network block devices in the uh, open vSwitch were breaking each other. So if you ran our uh, volume storage uh, service in our networking system on the same, uh, same machine, it would break. And I'm not sure what happened with that one, or what the, the root cause was there, but it was some bizarre thing that we got fixed. Um, we've had all kinds of errors, and we're constantly working with um, upstream providers and upstream uh, packages to fix things. So contributing a pattern is actually really easy. This is one of the important things. Um, at one point, we thought about trying to automate the process of identifying. Um, so a fingerprint is a, is a piece of the log that you could search in Elasticsearch that is, matches a bug. And we do this right now manually. Um, and it's not too hard if you understand the log formats and things like that. If you're sort of familiar with that, it's not too hard to find these on your own. Um, we tried some things to automate that, and it's, we're getting mixed results with that. Yeah? yeah. That is definitely a bug, because you need to be able to handle that no matter what. Uh, the lock weight timeout exceeded. Yes. Uh, this is a great you example. You find a lot of them. Just put in for every SQL query, return lock weight timeout exceeded first, and then succeed, and you'll probably find. Yeah, so we have, we've had a whole bunch of these bugs. This is actually an older bug, but we've had this three or four more times in, in different variations. Um, turns out we're not always great with managing our database issues, and this is a, you know, a great example of that. Um, and so this is a good example of actually a, how sometimes these failures are pretty easy to understand. You go through, you find the, the, the test that failed in uh, our integration suite, you backtrace that to the logs in the, in the code, so this is the, the, the Neutron server, and you see a stack trace from um, you know, the database system, and you go, oh, that's not supposed to happen, and then you file a bug for it. You add a query in like this, and you say, whenever that happens, it's this bug. And then you can automatic, automatically detect that, detect that in the future. Um, we also have a, we will try to keep up with our, our classification. So we have, we know the number of jobs that are failing, and we try to make sure that we're actually tracking that and making sure we don't have too many um, unknown failures in the system. So this is, I believe, the current status of it. Um, you can see our classification rate isn't that great. Um, but we try to keep that about 90%. If it's lower, it generally means that there's a bunch of bugs we don't know about that are in the system. Um, we also have the ability to look at, to filter this down by the past few days. So sometimes we'll just, you know, look for the things in the past two days or so to see if there's any new bugs in the system that started happening that we haven't been, uh, we don't know about yet. Um, and some next steps. Um, we don't actually have any, any reference for how bad these bugs are. We can't answer the question of how many, what percentage of jobs is this bug hitting? Um, it turns out that's actually not as easy as we thought it would be to do, um, and we haven't got around to actually um, implementing that solution. Um, the UI is a bit wonky, and we can do a better job of making that more intuitive and more useful. Um, and there's, we've talked about this for a while. We actually hit Elasticsearch pretty hard, and our logs are really bad in general. There's a lot of work to clean up our logs, make them more sensible, um, and all kinds of things like that. And this is sort of the beginning of our process to help us better manage our failures and this is also really useful for downstream deployers of OpenStack. So if you're running this big complex system, we actually know all the failures you're going to see probably in production. If your system is remotely like ours, even in small amounts, you may see these bugs every so often. We could tell you these are known bugs, and you could say we, you track how often they happen and things like that. And I'd like to thank everybody who's worked on this. We had a big, a lot of people uh, working on it. Um, a lot of these people are working and submitting fingerprints, which is a lot of the hard work to actually get this working. Um, it's, you know, it's a constant challenge to keep up with all the failures in the system. I think every week we probably have three or four patches coming in to file new bugs with the system. And thank you. Any questions? I have the magic question stick. Uh, so this elastic reject uh, 
uh, can it be used? Uh, is it hardcore for OpenStack, or can it be used by other projects as well with the Elasticsearch and all that? Yes, um, the code base is, is somewhat tied to our infrastructure, but the code is actually really small. It's maybe a few hundred lines of Python. Um, the basic model and a lot of the code actually can be reused, and we would I would love to work with somebody from another project to help help you know you know pull out the parts that are specific to us and not specific to us to make that more accessible. Okay, and it uh, pulls and it checks the bugs in Launchpad, right? If I'm yes, we okay. use Launchpad. Um, although we have our own bug tracker coming up, and we're probably going to have to add support for another bug tracker as well. Okay. Any other questions? Does it work in GitHub? No, but it, it wouldn't be hard to add that kind of support in it. Um, as I said, right now it's. We, we, when we wrote it, it was, um, a lot, it was mostly a proof of concept that sort of stuck, um, and we haven't really gone back and, and really flushed it out and pulled out the parts that are really tied to our infrastructure, um, our, the, you know, the format of Garrett, that kind of thing. Um, but that's something we'd be very interested in. I'd be very interested in doing is working with somebody on that if they're interested in adopting it. The hard work of this seems to be building fingerprints and uh, search queries into Elasticsearch. Um, do you have any insight into how you might automate that part away so that you could be yeah. automatically so it's, pulling tracebacks out of bugs? Right. So it's actually not, there's sort of a few answers to that. One, it's, um, that's now the hard part. That wasn't the hard part before. So that, we've actually moved the problem to just doing that as opposed to, you know, when you see a, fa you know, see a failed job to figure out what happened. Um, so if it's a stack trace, it's really straight. It's actually really simple. You look through, you look for stack trace in your logs, you find the stack trace. If your system is, you know, our system stack trace every so often when there's not a failure, but usually you can figure those out. So if it's a stack trace, it's pretty straightforward. If it's not a stack trace um, or an obvious error, it could be, you know, a network outage, um, that kind of thing. Um, those are pretty straightforward to understand. If it's more complex than that, um, we tried things like using, um, is it CRM 114? Um, which is the spam filtering. And we've gotten mixed results with that. It actually works okay. Um, I think the answer we found is that it's, if you're comfortable with your logs that you, you generate, it's not too hard. Um, it takes, one of the problems with these really complex, really subtle uh, failures, we had one which is a crosstalk between our PCR message bus and our uh, REST APIs. So we're getting RPC calls to REST and vice versa. And that took us like a month to figure out. Um, I think we had a, we could actually say this job failed for this reason, and we could actually track the failure in the, the test side, which isn't great. It's not the root cause, but it was something. Um, so I don't think the automation, I don't think that's actually as hard as, people, as you think it is, um, unless you don't understand your log format at all, which that should be worked on as well. Then. It's more monotonous than challenging. Sorry, just in terms of, of filing the fingerprints, is more monotonous than challenging. Because if you go into the um, unclassified page, which is where I usually go to if I decide that I'm going to spend some time uh, and, and file some bugs, so, so go to the uncategorized page and you just go down, so there's 20 total fails. So what I would do is I would open all those in a separate tab uh, and then find the stack trace and uh, find the similar failure. So it may be that 15 of those are all the same failure, so one fingerprint will get rid of 15 of those, and then you have five that you actually have to look a little bit deeper. So, but the, and actually, I'm talking about habits and so on, so I'll, I'll talk about a, little, a little bit about habits. The, part of the problem is, is it's monotonous, and you don't have any way of people actually tracking your work that you did something. Right. Whereas, when if you're doing code, or if you're doing something else, you get to wave a little flag at the end. Whereas, if you're classifying bugs, uh, other than Joe saying thank you very much and uh, posting your name on on the slide, you really don't get much to show for your time. So it's hard to motivate people to do it. Uh, the monotony is why I asked the question, because I understand that that's the, the difficult part. And I think the CRM114 answer is possibly a really good way. Bayesian classifying is a pretty interesting approach. I was just curious if you had thought about optimi uh, automating away this part of the pipeline that you've now built.
to get lost in other data because we have a lot of logs and there's a lot of, you know, we haven't tuned the system yet. So. And tuning is hard as well. So. The other thing is, I'll just make this point. It, it probably didn't come out in Joe's talk, but this is a very, very, very complex problem with a lot of moving parts because you have to totally understand all of the infrastructure um, interactions, which is a 20-minute talk on itself. Uh, and then you have to understand the additional part of Logstash and Cabana. And, and there's probably about uh, five people uh, who have the knowledge. And the thing of it is, is that they're so busy uh, fixing and classifying bugs and helping people and communicating and uh, that they don't have the time to go back and, and fix the infrastructure. Well, we should probably not go too far into afternoon tea, which I think is now. So thank you very much. Thank you.